Hold on, let me jump in here real quick. You're saying this dude was robbing the guards. All right, Banky, what's going on, man? Man, same old, same old, man. We just out here trying to live, trying to survive, getting back with the Banky and Joe show. You better bet it, man. Yeah. The look and feel of these videos is already going to be back to, <laughs> to what it once was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dynamic duo, man. We can bring y'all some great, great content. So let me start by saying that I am with you. The last video we did, people thought that I was in... Mexico or something. They said, is Joe even in the same room with Banky? Right, right. I am here with you. Uh, we filmed in your living room in the last video, but the lighting wasn't that good. So where we are right now, we're in your studio. Right. And uh, you got a nice little setup here, man. Yeah, man. This is where I make, make it happen at right here every day, seven days a week. Well, we had a whole bunch of ideas since getting back together and so many things that we're looking forward to being able to bring to After Prison Show and to Banky Pound. And that begins here today. Uh, this is not even the video that I wanted to begin with, but something better came while we were talking. Yeah. And let me go ahead and just jump right into <clears throat> where we're going. Uh, I was sharing with you that I was looking for this guy that people said that you they thought that you wore. Xavier Golden Tate, right. after we filmed the video, I was editing that last video and I said, let me go try to find this guy. Right. Still can't find a picture of him, can't find anything. But when I Google his name, the first thing that pops up is the parole board information from Virginia, where he's obviously listed on there for making parole. Uh, not sure when exactly he did, but I got to looking at this parole board information and it's pages and pages of documents right. of everybody in the Virginia system who is eligible for parole going up, whether they make parole or they don't make parole. And in this paperwork, it showcases names, it showcases the amount of time that people have served, uh, and it showcases you know whether they've made parole and if they didn't make parole, why they didn't make parole. But I was telling you that I was running across names of people who were going up for parole who had served either close to or more than 50 years in prison. Right. From there, you began telling me about some guys that you know personally who you served time with throughout the 33 years that you served who have served that amount of time and who are also some of the most notorious people in the Virginia Department of Corrections. Absolutely. I would uh <clears throat> I would probably uh seeing that list probably know most if not all of those names. Um but one of them did, you know, TBP, you know, Team Bank and Pound is very familiar with is currently serving time right now probably at year 50 um who is Bo Billy. Um I've did a couple of interviews, I mean, a couple of videos on my page about Bo Billy. Uh, the people that follow me are very familiar with Bo Billy. Uh, I could do stories forever with Bo Billy. Um, hopefully, prayerfully, uh, Bo Billy do get his release one day. Um, and I've told the people on my channel, and, and it's actual and factual, if you think Fleece Johnson got something to tell you, Bo Billy would definitely have something to tell you. But um, let me jump in there real quick. You mentioned Fleece Johnson. People on After Prison Show are like, what? I know that name. Like, yeah. who? Why does that sound familiar? Uh, Fleece Johnson, prior to him getting released, which I didn't even know he's out now, was notorious on the Internet, I believe, for a video of him comparing booty in prison to, to food or something yeah, like water, that. Water, water. It's more important than Wilder. <laughs> right. I had this video, a clip of this video from wherever this came from while he was serving time. Uh, he was a, he was known as a booty bandit, as you know, the booty warrior. <laughs> a lot of different nicknames for this yeah. guy. Uh, why is he relevant to you? Is it because of Bo Billy? 
Um, oh yeah, well, 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 it's a couple of reasons. That's something that I didn't even tell you. Okay, well, let me tell you this first. At one point in time, by me talking to Bo Billy, and, and you know, Bo Billy had been sent to several different states during his incarceration. One of them, he was actually on the compound with Fleece, he told me. Because when I was telling him how Fleece was out and Fleece was going crazy on the internet, he was like, man, they sent me up there one time, but I ain't last no more than 48 hours because, you know, I, I do what I do. He got out, you know, he started slinging that knife because he felt like everywhere they sent him, they were sending him for his demise. So he didn't stay there that long, but he had heard about Fleece and knew about Fleece. But what I didn't tell you was, Fleece been out a couple of years and he got a dude that's doing interviews with him, this, this um, like sit behind the camera is like we are now and he just interviewed Fleece because Fleece's name had got so big, so popular, he did the uh, 2020 interview where he said that famously that in prison that booty was more important to him than water. And then they did a, um, what did they call that? Boondocks. Uh, yeah, he was a, a right, character on character Boondocks. Boondocks. Well, some dude out here right now, I can't recall his name, he does these type of uh, cartoon character um, classes. And he actually did one with me and Fleece. I've seen and that actually. It, when Fleece meet, uh, Fleece Johnson meet Banky Pound in prison. So I'm like, boom, I didn't know nothing about it. So one of my you know, supporters sent it to me. I'm like, man, what? You know, and he done made a couple of them since then. But like, you've never met Fleece, Jones. I've never met Fleece, but the dude who do the interviews do with Fleece, who put Fleece on the internet, um, they do that live call in, and they was calling in, and people said, man, do, oh, do an interview with Banky Pound, do an interview with Banky Pound. So he reading the live joints, and he said, well, uh, yeah, well, I, I talked to Fleece about that, and um, Fleece said what? He said, doing an interview with Banky Pound, he said, I know, I don't know him, but I know his content, I respect him, he doing, you know, good things out there, whatever, whatever. Fleece was like, oh yeah, well, I do an interview with Banky Pound, if, if you like him, I like him, I do an interview with Banky Pound. So all of that, them little clips kind of like went viral. So that's, that's the thing with Fleece. But I know from Bo Billy that he had actually been in the same prison at the same time that Fleece was there. But... Bo Billy is, in my opinion, as I've said on my channel, uh, definitely top three. If, if if nothing else, I would say two, but definitely top three most notorious dudes has been in the Virginia penal system. You know, when I got into jail, uh, I what, heard Bo Billy's name. What year was that? When I was in the jail? Yeah. Uh, probably 88. And you were... Hearing his name, I heard you heard his you heard names like Bo Billy, Sam Pitts, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, what's his name, Mac Jefferson. You heard these names before you go into prison. You and know, back in the eighties, back in the eighties, because if it's um, if they've been locked up for fifty years, they've already been in prison for 10, 20 years at that point. Right, you know, and their name is just ringing. And Bo Billy has a legend in prison, man. And I, I was a uh, I was able to run into Bo Billy as well as Sam Pitts and some of these dudes. So when I ran into Bo Billy, um, like I said, I was already aware of him. Bo Billy was coming from out of state then. And when he was coming from out of state, at this time, I'm on the most dangerous prison in Virginia, which would be uh, Mecklenburg. And, you know, Mecklenburg was housing all of the people that had been, you know, somewhat violent in the system. And this is where you went. They only housed the most violent and they housed death row. So the death row was separate from us, but Mecklenburg was so dynamic was because it, it was so small and you had a single cell. Everybody on Mecklenburg was in single cell. They couldn't be housed with each other. They couldn't have a cell partner. So by us being housed in a single cell, whenever you get in trouble or you get in a, a situation and you go to the hole, you got to go on the list uh, and get in a line to come back out. So even when your time was up for whatever type of problems you got in, you still couldn't even come back to the yard because you had to wait till a bed was available. This is how Mecklenburg was run. So that was also a, a, an incentive for you not to get in trouble while you're on Mecklenburg because you might not get back out. I've known dudes that's been in, in the hole on Mecklenburg for, you know, uh, 10, 15 plus years, you know. So when I get to Mecklenburg, uh, I, I knew, I already knew about Bo Billy, but I had been there maybe about a year, Bo Billy come out of state, and it, the whole compound was lit up. Man, Bo Billy coming on, Bo Billy coming on. People knew that he was on his way coming. 
So I had had all of these thoughts in my mind, all this stuff I heard about him, all of this and all of that. Then when I see him, I'm like, man, this is going to be crazy. So when I actually seen him, you know, the legend was right in front of me. You know, he wasn't, Bo is not like one of those big muscle, like be on the weight pile type dudes, but he big, he's sturdy, he's, he, he's solid. He has humongous hands. And I say this, and um, people who know, who follow me, that know I done said this many times, Bo Billy probably got the most notorious, and we call him the, the, the notorious Bo Billy, but he probably got one of the most notorious mouthpieces ever too, man. He talked to people like, if you got any backbone in your body, you gonna, you gonna have to fight. He's it, just disrespectful, it, that disrespectful. Super ultra disrespectful, and with no cut card. Bo Billy was the first dude that I had ever seen at this point in my time being locked up that the police was actually terrified of. And when I mean, when I say terrified, I mean terrified. I have seen Bo Billy grab females on their butt and they so scared that they be like, oh, stop Bo. And I'm telling you, you cannot make this up. Is no one that's been in that system with me will, will deny anything that I'm saying. He just was feared, man. Dudes were scared of him. Because like I say, he was known to put some work in. He was known to fight. He known to be aggressive. And that's just what he was. And he won't scare to nobody. And he didn't care what the opposition was. You understand? He ain't care. And um, the thing about him was, what I learned after I got to know him was, his attitude was like that because he came in so young. He ended up getting caught up in, you know, doing drugs or whatever. Bo came in prison, I think, with 30 some years for a robbery charge that no one got hurt or uh, no one got killed. The money was minimal. You know, I think the police shot him. I think he shot at the police. 30 some years. Um, when he got in, he ended up getting a drug habit on, you know, at his own admission. And then, you know, he didn't have no whole lot of real support. And, you know, dudes start like, you know, they want to get paid for the drugs in there. Bo ain't had the money. So Bo started taking it because he can fight. So as he started taking the drugs and then, you know, he started building up a reputation or whatever that he, you know, he was running around here robbing people or whatnot. So then he knew the police that was bringing the drugs in. So Bo went a step further and started robbing the police. Hold on, let me jump in here real quick. You're saying this dude was robbing the guards who were bringing the drugs into the prison? Absolutely. Like, how would he do that? Like Straight up pull up on him when he know who bringing the sack in. He pulling up on him saying, let me get that. And and you can't take that to him no more. You got the pit stop right here and get it to me. And they like, man, what? And he'll, if he had to put hands on him, he'll put hands on him. And he tell him, what you going to go do? What you going to go do? You going to go tell him I robbed you for some drugs? Go ahead. You know, but he used a profanity because that's how he talked. You know what I'm saying? You be this, you be, I'll, I'll kill you when you come back to work tomorrow. And they was terrified of him. They set hits out on Bo, man. They try to pay inmates to kill Bo. The, people, the guards The did. guards have tried to pay people to assassinate Bo. Man, dude came to Bo's cell one time and threw acid on him while he was in the cell. But at the time, Bo had an afro. So when he came to the cell, and this is bars on uh, in the wall, it's bars, like the old prisons you see, like Shawshank and Dempsey. We got bars, not these solid doors they got down. So they come to the cell while Bo locked in and try to throw acid on him. But Bo said he seen as his hair was coming up. So Bo turned and the acid go across his hair, got part of his hair, but he had a big bush then back, you know, in the 70s. So he wiped it all out and everything. But the thing about it, what's so amazing about Bo to me, and I didn't know this till I was talking to Bo recently, um, this it, just amazing me because all of the incidents that Bo been in, which is a lot, he been in a lot of physical altercations. Bo told me he ain't never got stabbed. He ain't never got got. But he done got a whole lot of people. And when I tell you a whole lot, I mean a whole lot from state to state. But Bo ain't never, he's one of the rare persons that I can say that I even known of. Even I've been stabbed. He one of the rare dudes that I know that's been in that many altercations who ain't never got hit. Because of his mentality. If Bo think you're going to get him, if Bo got a problem with you, he going to get you, man. He going to move first. And and that's just amazing to me. He never got hit. But the thing that made his attitude to me change was 
when he was in the wall and he was doing all this stuff and he was going through this with the police and the inmates and making his mark, they had this big riot back in the day in the wall and a lot of police got hurt. A lot of police got hurt, I mean, hurt bad and stabbed up and everything. And they, they labeled Bo as the ringleader. They labeled him as the ringleader. They gave him some time for that in, in prison. Like I told you back in the day, I don't know if it's still the same, but when you get time in prison, you got to do that time flat. If you get 20 years, you got to do 20 years day for day, 365 days, 20 times. So let's dissect that a little bit for anybody who may not be following. You've already got your original prison sentence. That's what you're serving. If you catch a street charge, a new charge while you're serving time, there's no good time there's for nothing. that. Say you got 10 years, right? And you three years into your 10 year bid. You catch 20 years, right? You got to stop from where you was at during that time on that 10 and do that 20. When you complete that 20, 300, you know, 65 days, calendar years, 20 times, your sentence start back and you then you go into your release date. So, and he caught street he, charges. He caught street charges and to my understanding, I don't quote me, but I think, I think they gave him close to 50 years, right? So by him getting that much time, this is the time that he's doing now. So you're talking about a man that's going into prison with 30 some years under the 85% law that he would have already been out, you know, two or three times over. But they're holding him for this incident that happened with this big riot where a lot of officers got hurt and they labeled him the ringleader. They, they had some dudes that turned on him and said, yeah, where Bo was the leader, woo, woo, woo. And I think that soured his attitude towards, you know, convicts and inmates, you know, that these dudes turn on him and try to pin it all on him. They convicted him, to my understanding, for some blood that they say they found on his robe that came from an officer. This was before DNA, mind you. So now, you know, the Innocence Projects, uh, other people, a lot of people have come to his aid because they see the injustice and how much time he been doing and what's going on. So he is now, you know, still fighting for his freedom. And shout out to Karen Morris and she wanted the ringleaders and fighting for his freedom. And it's come to people's attention now that the blood that they convicted him of was not even blood of an officer. It was blood of another inmate. Oh, they've tested the DNA. They've since tested then? the DNA since they've had DNA. Wow. But yet and still they still holding him. You understand? So he's been going through a lot, man. Recently he had a uh, hip surgery. Uh he had a gallbladder removed. Um a lot of dudes in prison try to get their reputation off of both the young dudes, the young gang members, because it's a it's a it's a it's a notch in your belt to say you did something to Bo Billy. You know, because of how big his name is and how much stuff he done did. Like I said, man, I, I done seen Bo do some things in prison with these eyes that I ain't seen uh, uh, nobody do in prison. I seen Bo rob a poker game where you got at least three to four dudes in the game that's a killer. And Bo robbed the game. I'm talking about right there. He losing and he get mad and he robbed the game. This created such a big controversy on the compound because the dude who running the game is is a gangster and a big old muscle dude he's a gangster and this is a, this is a game he got a dude in there that got a murder charge in the system both robbed the game right then and there he said man i'm taking everything and he took it you know and and and, and we leave up off the yard everybody out there is everybody's high intensity like something getting ready to go off somebody getting ready to get killed but it don't so then when we leave and we separate on Mecklenburg, you got to go to one yard and then people in this building got to go the other way. So once we separate and get between the gates, the dude that was running the game, little buddy, little buddy then say, Bo, you know, you know what you did, man. You can't get away with that. So Bo turned around and was like, I just did it. Why you ain't say nothing there? Why you waiting for the fence between us? I just did it. So he hollering like, nah, you, nah, that, I can't, I can't, no, nah, that ain't right. You ain't going. Bo said, well, come back on the yard. We talk about when you come back. Well, I'll see you when you come back. Man, the penitentiary was so scared that administration got wind of that. This is my good word. They locked the compound down. They locked the compound down before we could get back out on that yard, and they shipped Bo Billy that morning to another state, and they shipped uh, Lil Buddy to another institution, and all of the dudes that was with Lil Buddy that they thought was his partners, they shipped them to different institutions, and they shipped a couple of dudes that they know was gonna ride for Bo Billy. 
That's just how much power he had in the system where they knew that if they would open them doors with that friction going, somebody was going to die. Guaranteed. You know what I'm saying? He, Bo ain't doing no playing. Bo ain't doing that little scratching or pulling a knife and talk. Bo coming to get you, man. And um, and I seen it with my own eyes, man. And uh, like I say, he he legendary in the system. He done did many, many things, man. And like I say, every institution, to my understanding, that they sent them to out of state, that state sent them back. And they sent them back because when he got there, he automatically produced some violence because he ain't want to be there. And he's the only dude that I know of as well, too, as um, far as like segregation. Both have been in segregation for 20 something plus years. They've had Bo up in the mountains every time they brought him back from um, out of state. He's been either at Wallace Ridge or Red Onion. To my understanding, recently he was just sent to, um, and he got bad cataracts, his eyes going bad. He's 67 years old. To my understanding, they just sent him to Sussex One, which is on Flatland. We consider Wallace Ridge, Red Onion, King Mountain. That's up in the mountains. Bobo's up, been up there since he came back from out of state, which to date probably is 23 to 24 years. You understand? And up, man, in SAG, man. I did uh, 14, 2004, uh, 9, 10, 11, 12, 30, I did six years up there in 33 years. The worst place I ever been, bar none, easily, hand down. Man, did 20 some plus years up here. You know what I'm saying? Because they ain't want them nowhere else on flatland. They had to keep them up there. It's racist up there. Them people got guns up there. They got dogs up there. They got gangs up there. And that's where they kept that man at in, in for 20 some years. And you talking about a man who don't even got a life sentence. You talking about a man who ain't got a murder charge on the street, ain't got a murder charge in prison. But yet at the same time, you got people walking out here on the streets right now they then had two life sentences, three life sentences, four, five, six. I know all of the four mentioned walking around on the street right now. They had six life sentences. This man only got a life sentence. I know people got murders. I know people got double homicides, triple homicide on the street. Bo Billy's still locked up. I want to go back to a couple of things that you had mentioned right there. Uh, let's go back to the acid incident where the guy came and threw acid on Bo Billy. You know, what was his... Clap back to that. <laughs> you know what his clap back was. <laughs> so he got the guy. <laughs> if you stay on that, if you stay on that cup, man, yeah, you 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 got. Yeah, he got him and anybody who liked him, anybody who was cool with him. Bo Bo got some. Uh, Bo, hey, listen, this is why they don't want to let him out, man. Bo got a lot of. Uh, Bo got a lot of he got a lot of victims, man. That that, that them played with him in there. Then it ain't it ain't it ain't work out for him, man. It ain't work out for. Him. And the thing about it is, he can get to you any way you want it. He can fight and he'll push that knife. And he ain't doing no running. He ain't doing no backing down. I think it plays to his detriment a lot too because he got so much warrior in him and he'd have been through so much he just came back down from that because even like right now you know trying to get out man i mean within the last year some some gang members jumped him in the cell you know and his mentality is he 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 can't even accept that he want him he want to hurt him so bad you know what i'm saying that it, it just it eats at his soul you know, because that's just in him. And he know that this is nothing that they would try if, you know what I'm saying, he was, you know, healthy and he was who he was. But make no mistake about it, man, even at 67, man, Bo ain't nothing to play with. You know what I'm saying? Shoot, within the last two years, he whooped two dudes, except two young dudes that was gang members that tried to jump him in the park. You know, and then somebody pushed him off. He was on the phone. Somebody pushed him off the phone um, within the last two years too, and he broke his hip. So he had to have hip surgery. You know, he couldn't even let that go. He wanted to, he speculating on anybody who he thought did it, anybody who he thought had something to do with it, and he antagonizing them every day walking around with a hurt hip, trying to say, yeah, you gonna pay for that. It's just in him, man, you know what I'm saying? Because you gotta think, this man been in prison since he was 17, 18 years old, and now he's 67 years old. You know what I'm saying? So he that's all he know is defend himself. That's all he know is to stay safe. Because the first time you get to slipping in the penitentiary, man, 
it might be your last time. You know, so yeah, he he is 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 not an officer, is not an inmate, <laughs> is not a convict, is no one that did significant time in the Virginia penal system, either as an inmate or or or, or as working there who do not know who Bo Billy is. Bo Billy name is so popular in prison. Do you know his name is not even Bo Billy? Do you know the police call him Bo Billy? You know the parole board call him Bo Billy? His government name is Henry Gorham, but his nickname is Bo Billy, so the name is so big, the police don't even, the police call you your last name, they'll say, hey, yo, Guerrero, come get your mail. They say, Bo Billy, come get your mail. That's how much respect he got in the system, you know, but he feared more than he respected. And they say fear lasts as long lasts longer than respect. So that's what it is with him, man. But he 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 is definitely on um, top of the line when it comes to uh, dudes you don't want to play with in the penitentiary system. I don't want to make this super long. Super long. <laughs> <laughs> I just had to throw that in. There. Yeah. Look, uh, the reason that we're even talking about Bo Billy right now is because we go back to the beginning of this video, I was talking with you about the parole board list that I had run into with so many names on it from so many years, every month, there's tons of people going up for parole. And I was telling you that I was seeing guys up there who had served upwards of 50 plus years. We begin talking about Bo Billy. And that idea turned into us beginning to share some of the most notorious prisoners that you know from serving time yourself throughout the 33 years that you served. And we're going to go one for one with this, a video for After Prison Show, a video for Banky Pound, and we're going to create a playlist of probably numerous wild stories of these type of guys that you know personally. But one other thing I want to mention in relation to that parole board paperwork was, you know, there were guys listed on there who weren't making parole and the parole board would copy and paste what looked like the same generic reason why guys weren't being released, would diminish the serious nature of your crime, uh, you know, not ready for release or institutional record, yeah. negative. But there were some who weren't granted parole where it said not interested in parole. And... I want you to elaborate on your thoughts on that because when I shared that with you, when I saw that, I'm thinking to myself, you've got guys in the system right now who have served upwards of 50 plus years who are eligible for parole and they're going up in there, what, saying, nah, I don't even want parole. Like, I don't even want to come back on the streets was how it was seeming to me. But you've got a different take on that. Yeah, that's 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 misleading. You know, and that's how that's how it be, right? Because it probably looked like that to the public. But in actuality, what it is is all of those reasons that you're saying you're right. You know, that's a term that I learned since I've been out here, copy and paste. But for us, we just we we just say in system, just cookie cutter answers. They already they know what they're gonna say. So me, for instance, I 15 times, same thing. Hold on, you went up for parole 15, 15 times. 15 times. In same, 33 years. 33, same, same um, response every time. Now, I'm going to show you the contradiction in that. Okay, if I go up this year, right, and they turn me down, they say serious nature of the crime, which never changes, and Virginia inmates um, challenge that in Supreme Court many times, serious nature of the crime, how can the nature of the crime change? It is what it is. That never changes. They say have not served enough time on your sentence, uh, uh, poor institutional um, behavior. You get one charge for having contraband. You know, all of these are just the regular answers that are uh, not 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 fit uh, for society right now. All of these are the regular answers, right? So if I go up for parole this year, and they give me four reasons, and those are the four reasons, right? Not served enough time in your sentence, or serious nature of the crime. Oh, this is one of their main ones. Release at this time would diminish the serious nature of the crime, right? Like saying you you discredited in the crime. Okay, now here's the problem with that. Now I go up next year, right, which is only 12 months later, and I make parole. So you mean to tell me all of those reasons disappeared in 12 months? You see what I'm saying? So they give you all of these cookie-cutter reasons until they decide that they want to give you parole. Me personally, I think that 
they do that to everybody and you're not gonna make it unless you have a serious push from the outside. Meaning like your family that got these people on contact and push. Showing. Other than that, I think they're just gonna keep giving you the same answer, right? Because you can't, those reasons that they're giving cannot disappear in 12 months. You know, serious nature of the crime is still the serious nature of the crime. Then they'll give you release at this time with diminished the seriousness of the crime. But you could have a co-defendant who's been out for five years, 10 years. It didn't diminish his serious nature of his crime and he had the same crime. So with that being said, a lot of people, um, they get sick and tired of that, man. And they don't feel like they're going to make it. So what they do is when it, their name come up on the docket to go up for parole, um, they just said they ain't going. Let them make the decision because they're going to make the decision with or without you. So it's not like people is going in there and say, no, I'm not interested in parole. Nah, they just not even going up when the people are calling them for the interview for the parole. They just don't go. They say, I ain't going. Let, they, let them do what they're going to do. That's what they're doing. When also, too, to add to that, you go up for parole and do an interview for your parole with somebody who don't even make the decision. They don't even make the decision. This is a parole examiner who comes in, do the interview with you, make notes of what you said, then they take that information and give it to the parole board who has never saw you, talked to you, looked at you in your eyes, and they make a decision based upon that. So the process is so um, stressful, man, and so um, biased that a lot of dudes who've been locked up that long they don't even want to put themselves to through it. Y'all, you know, TBP, y'all know as one of the dudes on my channel, Calvin Tucker, bad, watch your mouth. Calvin Tucker used to do that. They come get him for a parole and Calvin, Calvin Tucker said, man, I ain't, man, don't, man, don't come get me for that no more. I ain't going up in there. They gonna get to me when they get to me. You know, and that's how he felt about it. And he was one of the first dudes I actually seen do that. And I was like, man, you tripping. Man, they're going to do what they want to do anyway. I ain't going up in there. I done been turned down this many times. Man, don't come get me away from work, man, for that. I ain't going. Don't I ain't going. So they just don't go in there for the hearing. But the people do what they want to do anyway. If they give it to them, I ain't never known. Eh, maybe one person. I ain't never known nobody they gave it to and they turned it down. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's, it's not like it says. That's, that's misleading, man. You know, I don't, I, like I tell people all the time, I know thousands and thousands of dudes in prison. I don't know not now one of them that don't want to get out. You know, so yeah, that's misleading. Definitely misleading. I want to wrap this up on one final thing. We were talking about going in front of the parole board. You know, this information that I ran across that I found interesting, so much perspective that you share on all of that. Going back to Bo Billy, you know, this is a guy who's probably gone up in front of the parole board countless times, probably been, been turned down countless times. But since you began talking about Bo Billy, because this isn't the first time that you're sharing this guy's name over on your YouTube channel, you've already shared quite a bit about Bo Billy. We're doing this video here to familiarize after prison show with who this guy is. But it was since you have began talking about Bo Billy, you've actually been in contact with Bo Billy, which the system has now shut down. But when you began sharing about Bo Billy over on Banky Pound, a lot of other people got interested in this guy's story. And I want you to talk about how notorious his name is now out here, just like his name is also in the system. Oh yeah, it's a lot of people that took interest in um, Bo Billy, man. Um, uh, one being, like I say, uh, uh, Miss Karen Morrison with the organization called Fighting for Freedom, and she is definitely uh, fighting for freedom, and she's got a lot of people um, out. She's got a lot of people uh, reunited with their families. She's definitely on top of Bo Billy case. Uh, you have other YouTubers who've made uh, videos about Bo Billy. Um, you know, shout out to Cartoon. I think it's 53. He's made uh, videos about Bo Billy as well as other uh, YouTubers. You have the, uh, the prison advocate uh, for prison talks, Kevin Jeans, that's his name. He's been fighting for Bo Billy, man. Um, uh, tooth and nail, his whole family, they got a whole campaign. We had free Bo Billy t-shirts. Uh, Bo Billy name is, is notorious out here in the streets now. And, um, you know, uh, our, our YouTube channel, 
um, I think is largely responsible for that, for me bringing this name out here to people. But it's really TBP Nation because I just put the story out there, but y'all spread it, the story, which made it reach to other people. And um, I think he got a lot, a lot of support, man. He even have, uh, you know, some, um, um, uh, what you call them, uh, the, 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 the free people, what is uh, the people, the Innocence Project working on his case as well. He has some college students that's been interested in trying to, you know, dissect his case and see why is it that this man who don't have some of the most uh, notorious charges that people are usually, you know, guilty of doing this much time for, why don't he have these type of charges? Why do this man who haven't took anybody's life, no matter how dangerous they say he is, but he hasn't took life yet, why has he been locked up for 50 years? Why is this man who don't have a life sentence still locked up when you got people walking around here on the street who had multiple life sentences? So a lot of people has got interested in trying to find out, you know, what's going on with Bo Billy, man. And I personally think myself at 67 years old, man, he, you know, I believe everybody deserves a second chance. I believe he's well over um, deserving of a second chance. Um, I think he's probably been up for parole probably over 30 times you know so you, you know you you keep turning this man down for the same exact reasons and um i just think it's eye opening to the public when they hear this you know this is why a lot of people has got involved in it man but um hopefully man he'll get his liberation soon i do know i i still am in contact with him through people other than himself he contacts somebody else they contact me so we definitely still in contact i do know he is very very interested in doing some interviews and exposing a whole lot of things when he get on the street. And I told y'all he's the type of dude that I would probably get out of the way like Joe is right there and just let him talk. And I'm guarantee y'all gonna be uh, 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 thoroughly entertained and um, uh, eyes glued to the camera, man, because he got a lot to say. He's seen everything. He was there when they had the uh, the notorious escape off of death row, the Bradley brothers. He was there at Mecklenburg. He was he was right there. He has the inside scoop. He even knows the officers that was allegedly involved. He knows everything. I Every, did a video about that. It, it, well, he was there. He can tell you everything that you think about, everything that you wanted. Did this happen or how that happened? He knows it all. He I've I've talked to him about it. Um, it's nothing in the system, man. In the Virginia. Virginia penal system anyway that has transpired in the past 50 years that's noteworthy that um, Bo Billy don't know about, you know, or have been involved in. So, you know, yeah, man, so just I pray for his liberation, man, and uh, hopefully he get out here soon and healthy, man. We're going to go ahead and wrap this up, and I want to do so on one final thing. Uh, you're sharing with After Prison Show about Bo Billy. Many years ago, I did something called the 20-Day Prison Story Marathon. And I'm inspired by that to do with you a video for After Prison Show, a video for your channel, and then back and forth of you sharing about the most notorious guys that you knew from prison. And we begin that here today with Bo Billy. Bo Billy. Who else are you going to be bringing to the table? Oh, man, we could talk about Sam Pitts, in my humble opinion, and probably a lot of other people's number one most notorious dude ever come through the Virginia penal system. Uh, we could talk about Spook Dust. We could talk about Mark Peace. We could talk about Angelo Ford. We could talk about Jew Baby. We could talk about uh, uh, Wyatt Earp. We can talk about, man, there's just so many, man. You know, I did 33 years, man, 12,367 days. I done ran across them all. You know, you got Cupcake. You got Shorty Pimp. You got Pinky. You got Riverboat. You, it's just so many, man. And then you got to remember, I was on Mecklenburg. And I'm telling y'all, the system is different now. You got Wallace Ridge. You got Red Onion. You got King Mountain. You got Sussex 1. You got Sussex 2. It's different now. When I was first coming in the system and you was, you know, doing all this crazy stuff or whatever you want to call it, pushing the Bethlehem, the knife, um, it wasn't number one place for you to go. The last buck stopped at Mecklenburg. When you get to Mecklenburg, that's it. 
if you so out of order, uh, they probably gonna kill you. You know, just truth being told, they probably gonna kill you because if they can't control you, this is before all of these other prisons without guns and this, they had a tag team. And only people was there were death row and out of, out of order inmates. So I'm here, I'm on the same compound with Cupcake, Bo Billy, George McGee, Sam, uh, not Sam Pitts, but uh, uh, Roscoe, uh, Pinky. I mean, I'm on here with all of these dudes and I'm probably 22, 23 years old, man. So, you know, they tell you don't go out on the yard if you ain't willing to die, <laughs> you know, but <laughs> You stay back there, you feel like you're dying anyway. So, but um, yeah, I I know all of these dudes because I was around them, and um, to be honest, which I grew up with them. You know, I grew up with them. All of these cats was in the system before me, and um, but I grew up with them. You know, so yeah, we can go on 20, 30, 40, 50 days, cause I know them all. <laughs>